Welcome to Playing for Tetsuji, a cardboard reality podcast series covering the two-player gaming experience that focuses discussion on Go and other abstracts, war games, and heavy euros. Today on my pilot episode, I invite Joel on to discuss Hannibal, the two-player war game set during the Second Punic War. This should be a fun discussion as Joel has limited exposure to war games and seems intent on avoiding them. I'll be curious to hear his thoughts. We also share what's interested us lately and I wrap up by revealing my album of the week because I believe great music should be shared. I'm your host, Nick Northcutt. Enjoy the show. Today, I am in the studio joined by Mr. Joel Mosier. How's it going? Good. How are you, sir? I'm pretty good. I Can't like, complain. I like your shirt. Oh, thanks. Yeah. For those watching the video cast, they can see the estates. Yep. Bid and build there on the bottom. Yep. And then there's uh, on this side, a little Simply Complex logo Yeah. <laughs> from Capstone, in case you don't know. I'm guessing you picked that up during the uh, PAX Unplugged. Yep. Yep. During the convention. That's what I thought. Yep. Had to represent while I was working the booth. Absolutely. So now you have that shirt, you have an ca- actual like legit capstone, capstone shirt, games one. and yep. you have a heavy cardboard shirt. Yep. I don't have the fancy like polo one that uh, no that car- Clay has though. You don't have a cardboard reality shirt yet though. I'm getting there. I'm okay. getting there. All right. It's yep. fine. We are going to print some special yep. patron exclusive ones soon. So. Yep. Uh, all right. So uh, I always like to start the show and I say always, this is the first time I've ever done this show. Yep. Always the first time ever. <laughs> this, this is the, the first time and it will be tradition. Yep. Um, talking about what we're interested in recently, it could be board gaming, maybe not board gaming. Yeah. Uh, I find that I'm a passionate person and whether I'm into a specific board game in the moment or a TV show or music or a book, whatever it is, I'm yeah. fully into it. So uh, I think this is a good way to kind of get out whatever it is that i'm excited about and share it with you guys uh so the first thing that i've been into lately is and i say into i'm more excited to play it it's a bunch of anticipation okay combat commander oh europe i bought combat commander europe and the quote unquote uh expansion the big box expansion called uh combat commander mediterranean okay the reason i say that is because it was actually intended to be one full game there was just so much content in the box that gmt was like no 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 we're gonna, <laughs> gotta make this two separate things oh you mean they didn't want to do a gloomhaven or anything yeah, like that otherwise it'd be too expensive <laughs> uh it's already like if you're gonna buy it straight from gmt you're looking at spending like 70 80 bucks on Shoo. one box it's it's 50 yeah. 60 if you get it that's crazy like on cool stuff or amazon or whatever yep um but it, uh europe just came back in print uh from the p500 so i grabbed a copy on sci of both that and mediterranean super excited that comes with basically 24 maps and just tons of content to go through and it's this is a uh, if you don't know what combat commander is it's a well renowned uh two player war game where it's it is hex encounter which i know that kind of has a bad rep from some people and i haven't really experienced much hex encounter but the me either what people complain about is that the more complex hex encounter games first of all sometimes they go on forever second of all you start stacking all these different hexes on top of the hexes and these units have all kinds of different conditions and you Uh can't see what those conditions are what health they have without like lifting up hexes and it's just fiddly gotcha okay this one doesn't seem to be that bad at all Um, okay it 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 like get rid of that or it plays in two to three hours and it has uh the hexes are big enough that you can fit uh, more than one unit in a specific hex without stacking okay. them. Gotcha. And the, I don't think the board's ever really, from what I've seen from video footage, it doesn't look that crowded. There's not that much stacking. Okay. So it kind of tries to manage that. And what I'm excited about space is... Space issue. Sure. And what I'm excited about is it's kind of a infantry, like squad-based combat where I feel like a lot of war games have been focused on like the macro where you see like a world map or a country map and you're moving units around from zone to zone and you kind of have the battle from like way high up but this is zoomed in really fine and low and you're just focused on one battle and that's the entire game and it's just units moving tactically on the board this is like a very tactical skirmish based okay combat scenario so that really excites me um and it has a uh random scenario generator in the mediterranean box so basically infinite replayability from what i can tell so almost have it learned can't wait to play it soon um so anything interesting you lately um i guess this is the opposite of interest but something i've decided that i want to try to do um 
I guess two things. I'll mention two things. So one that I've been kind of back interested in, I've kind of always been mildly interested in it, but uh, Rocket League, I've been playing it a bit more. It's a um, hard game. What? I feel like the, the learning curve on that game is so steep. Like, oh, it is. It's absolutely steep. It's yeah. insane. Yeah, but I, uh, one of my old um, coworkers um, at my previous job, he plays it, and so we've been playing a lot together, and we've we just can like are continually getting better and better. Um, he's like the whole rank, like the whole like ranking system higher than me. Um, but I'm catching up. Is like, this the same guy that you rock climbed with? Uh, no, same okay. first name actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, both named Andrew, but one of the like four on that team. It was ridiculous. Too many Andrews. Um, but no, this is the other one. He actually just got a new job as well um, at another uh, local company. So, um, but. Uh, so that, I've been playing that a bit more. Uh, might actually end up playing it more tonight. He said he's a he's a bachelor uh, this week, so he'll be wanting to play more because um, his wife and child are out of town. I think so. But uh, the thing I've been kind of less interested in, and I finally pulled the trigger to do this. Um, I canceled my Netflix subscription. Yes, this is a, I think a cool thing to listen yeah. about. I'm curious to see how it'll go for you. Yeah, so I I, I realized lately that basically my I, Nick and I have kind of talked about this, but I'll uh, elaborate more for the show a little bit. The when I like I noticed that if I sit down at like on the couch and turn on the TV and turn on Netflix or whatever it is, I will end up being on the couch for like four hours. Yeah. Like that is, that ends up being my entire night and I get nothing accomplished. Yep. Like I'll even sit down with my work laptop or my personal laptop to do other kind of things randomly. And I won't do anything like I'll, it'll be open and I'll like flip through random stuff, but I won't do anything like not anything actually constructive. So I finally decided I was like, you know, I'm about to, I'm going to be moving out of this place soon. And I was like, what if I just canceled my Netflix subscription and I got rid of my TV and didn't take it to my next place? Like what's the worst thing that could happen? I end up getting another TV. Like, okay, like that's the worst thing. And your or, TV's old anyways. So. And my TV's old. Like it, I had it since I've had it since freshman year of college. Yeah. So it's at least like seven years old. Um, and so it's like, if that's the worst thing that happens, like, all right, cool. I get a new TV. But then it's like, I'm going to be moving to a studio. So I want a little bit more space and not having like a TV with like a TV stand and all of that. And just having a little bit more open space, not having to have the couch in the middle of the room. So that it's facing a wall where the TV is like now the TV, now the couch can be like against the wall and open up the space a little bit more. And so like sure. just kind of thinking about that. So that's just kind of what I've been, I guess not thinking about lately or I, I just finally uh, a couple days ago, just canceled cancel my Netflix subscription. I think technically it doesn't go out until my, my next pay cycle, I think, which is like April 4th or something weird. Um, but yeah, so that's, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll keep you guys updated, but that also might mean that getting out more content is a lot easier. <laughs> hey, that could be a bonus. Yeah. So, um, just easier to record, easier to edit all of those things. So that, that's kind of the goal is to give myself more time to edit. Cause I know that if I sit down in front of the computer to edit, I'll do it. Especially now that we're getting into the video realm, yeah. that definitely increases the amount of time you're yeah. sitting at your computer. Yeah. All I have to do is just sit down and I know I'll edit. And it was the same thing like with the TV. The trigger is sitting on the couch and turning it on. In other, in other words, uh, Joel is so devoted to you fans that he is throwing his TV away, <laughs> canceling his Netflix subscription yep. uh, just so he can edit more podcast stuff. Just for you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's awesome. I commend you for that. I, I'm really curious to hear how that goes for you. And if yep. you definitely notice a spike in productivity, which yeah. you should, yeah. unless you somehow fill the void of no TV with something else, right? yeah. which actually is kind of funny. Are you playing rocket league on your computer? Occasionally. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, cause yeah. if you're getting rid of your TV, then you no. can't. <laughs> okay. No, I play on my computer. No, I don't play like any video games on. So are you TV, selling your so. game console too? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. So we'll That's see how it goes, exciting. but the, the biggest thing is that it, even if it doesn't make me more productive, just, it doesn't add any value to my life. Like it really doesn't P watch it. Like I don't, it's not like I'm like writing about it or it's not like I have like a blog or a podcast about like watching all these shows. I just, it's just like drone, just drone watching and not, and just like draining my brain. Right. So which some people would say like, oh, it's like how you're like recuperating your brain, but it's like, Neh. 
I could do that in other ways. The first hour. <laughs> but yeah, right, right. Yeah. Now four hours in, you're like, no. Now you're just like, or you spend you're the, zombied out. You find a show that you're going to binge, and then you spend the entire like weekend watching the yep. whole first season. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Been there, done that multiple times. Me too. I, I mean, I was running out of stuff to watch on Netflix, and it was finally just like, what was I even gaining? So, yeah. <laughs> But anyway, this show is not about that. This show is about two-player games. It is about two-player games, and this episode specifically is about Hannibal and Hamilcar, uh, which is a 20-year anniversary edition, I believe, of the original no. Hannibal. Yep. So it's it's the same game. We're not talking about Hamilcar. I haven't learned the rules for that yet. Uh, that is actually about um uh the first punic war and it takes place the the map if you get the 20th anniversary you actually flip it over and it has a more naval based map for hamilcar um with a whole different like naval based combat system that i've not learned so cool. one of these days on this on this show i'll probably talk about hamilcar but today we're talking about hannibal so if you don't know anything about Hannibal, uh, it's a card-driven um, war game. So there's basically one shared deck of cards that we're going to be drawing from every round. And those cards are going to have uh, points in the uh, top left uh, that you can use. I think they're called operational points in this game. They always call them something yeah. different in every game. I yeah. think like ops points. We're just going to call them ops points. Yep. Um, so you have ops points in the top left that you can use to take specific actions. And there's also an event on the card. And the event sometimes can be used for Rome or used for Carthage. And so the crux of the game is just playing from these hand of cards. Uh, each of you are playing from the same deck, but you all have your own secret individual yep. hand of cards. Like some of them are dual purpose, right? Some can be, yeah, like... Well, or like neutral or something where they like can be like the event can be used for either side. Correct. Yeah. yeah. There, there are some that the event could be used for either side, especially like the major campaign, right? Like that's yeah. just moving your armies. So yeah. you can move up to like four armies, uh, 10 spaces each, I think yeah. with the major, uh, campaign. But, uh, so yeah, this is the second Punic war, uh, which is a conflict that happened way back in the day. This is ancient time, isn't it? Um, is this, I think it's BC. I think it is BC. Two, three hundred BC. Yeah, that sounds right. Yep, I can picture or it. Four or five hundred, maybe. I can picture. No, I think it's yeah. two or three hundred BC. Yeah. I can picture the date. Uh, so yeah, it takes place um, back in. Uh, you have Carthage, uh, just right off of Africa, and then obviously Rome, and uh, Hannibal hails from Carthage, or back in the day, it's called Carthago. Yep. And he started making his conquest on uh, Rome. Yep. So historically, he kind of marches around uh, Africa and then kind through of the Alps. through the Alps and comes down with his elephants through the Alps and a huge army and wins every single battle yep. besides the very last one. I say wins all of the battles but loses the war. Yeah, wins all the battles besides the last one and then loses the war, Yep, uh, which is Because he crazy. was completely out of resources and troops and all of that at that and, point. Yeah, so. and Scipio Africanus came in at that point and yep. kind of outwitted him, kind of figured out how to best Hannibal at his own game because Hannibal was extraordinary when it came to military tactics. Yep. Uh, so... Yeah, so that's kind of the premise of what we're doing. Um, so let's just kind of get into uh, the initial thoughts. Let's talk about, let's settle on theme first. Do you feel like Hannibal uh, was a thematic experience? Uh, yes and no. Um, so this was kind of, just this is a short little premise. This is kind of like one of my first actual war games. Right. Um, Beyond this, you've played... Like, you've played, like, Forbidden Stars. Yeah, I played Forbidden yeah. Stars. I played, like, 13 minutes. The Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> yeah, of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, But you haven't really played, like, any legit, like, no. full-fledged, like, historical war game. Correct. Like, Hannibal yeah. felt totally different than Forbidden Stars. Yeah. Same thing with, like, 1775 is technically historical and technically war-based, but it's not remotely the same system. Yeah, it's much so, closer to risk. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, the the theme is definitely there, and and a lot of and with a lot of the cards, there are like events from that time period because I, I studied Latin, so I, I'm familiar with the time period, um, and and I feel like in that way it is, but also um, there are parts of it that kind of just like break a little bit of it. Like they, it is hard for Carthage to sail, but technically it's. Um, 
possible in the game, even though in the story it really didn't happen. He just marched around instead of sailing because they were too. Because um, I think historically Carthage was not good at building ships. So that that's a situation where the game does a really good job of uh simulating that right yeah they do it is hard because it's harder like rome is going to have a successful voyage uh period like period. there's no way yeah. to fail yeah there's no way to fail uh carthage actually has to do a check and you definitely have a risk of losing your entire uh army that moves through that naval yeah. movement they could actually like crash in the middle of the ocean and you yep. lose your army right yeah or sink and that definitely like especially like if you have hannibal or somebody you don't want to sail with hannibal because even a slight risk of losing hannibal early game is a big deal yeah um you do eventually get him back but building back those combat units and amassing your army again takes a significant amount of resources and time yeah uh so and honestly that's how rome basically will win is just through attrition it's through Surviv slow attrition. surviving yeah yeah slow survival and attrition which i honestly think the theme comes through really well in this game because yeah like what you're mentioning with sailing sure carthage can sail yeah but they have a high risk of fail and yeah, and and ways to mitigate throughout the game yeah um but they definitely have a high risk of failing yeah and uh you can't just say carthage can't sail because that's not what happened historically because then sure. you basically create this very linear version yeah. of the game and how it could play out yeah. right like and, you don't want don't, the game to be on rails sure yeah and, and i don't necessarily know that they never sailed i just know historically that wasn't the main way that they got there historically the main way is that well obviously he goes through the alps and loses a, a fair portion of his elephants basically if he didn't have to go through the alps he would have crushed hannibal would have absolutely crushed rome like the the first Without even trying the first Punic War right is a lot naval it's definitely naval based and yeah. it's still Carthage versus Rome so like they definitely have sailed yeah. like it's not like they didn't know how to use boats yeah they just didn't have as good of a navy yeah well that and trying to haul that many elephants with boats <laughs> I think is a bit harder I'm just imagining like that conversation like we can take the boats and just lay siege to Rome right now and Hannibal's like nah we have to take the elephants elephants yeah. can't fit on the boat sir yeah like, they <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But your forty some elephants or whatever like can't hold. Yep. Like sorry, we have to take the elephants. We're gonna march all the way around in the yep. winter through the mountains. <laughs> yep. Through Spain, like yeah. Uh so how else is this game thematic? Um I feel like kind of what you're saying where at the beginning of the game, Carthage is set up in a way that they feel stronger. They have yep. more generals in play. Uh they have a, maybe a bit of an easier time of getting reinforcements early game uh but hannibal is just incredibly overpowered at the beginning of the game you yeah. start as rome uh you start with a couple uh consoles that aren't very good no nope. which are like the roman generals yeah uh and it's kind of by design hannibal can come through march through the alps uh in the first couple rounds of the game and win pretty much any battle that he encounters yeah. it's not a guaranteed win uh, but it definitely favors Hannibal at the beginning of the game. Yep. And that's why Rome needs to have the strategy where they're trying to outlast Carthage and dwindle down their um, their actual like combat units yeah. throughout play. Mm -hmm. And Rome also has, the, I think, the upper hand on pushing the political control. So this game has a bunch yeah. of political control markers yeah. that you lay out all, all across the board. And the more zones you control politically over zones that your opponent controls politically uh, is good for you at the end of the round. You have this attrition phase where, let's say, Joel has 12 zones controlled to my 10. Yep. There's a difference of two. Then I have to remove two of my political control markers yep. off of the board. So he slowly starts uh, winning by way of attrition or yep. um, yeah. political might. Um, because I think, what is it, the less political, or well, you lose the political control markers, which makes you lose the overall control of a region, and then you don't get as many cards during combat. Yes. And that's kind of the primary way that Rome is going to, I mean, kind of like I said at the beginning with attrition, like, that's basically Rome's game. Well, so, yeah, during combat uh, with the uh, political control markers, if, let's say I start losing political control over a region that I'm going to go to battle in. Uh, the less political control I have in that region, the less cards I actually get to draw into my hand when we battle because I don't have that support from yep. the region itself, right? Yep. 
so yeah, Rome, I think definitely has the edge in that way. And I think Carthage has to play the more aggressive in your face game at the front end. Yeah. Um, and I think he kind of levels out mid game where it, you know, it's anybody's game. Yeah. And then Scipio comes out and kind of starts to turn the tide a bit. Maybe. I can't. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're Joel. Unless you're really bad like me. <laughs> so, so Joel, yeah. what did you do with Scipio? So I just immediately sailed him to Carthage. Yep. So he went to Africa. Yep. And failed miserably and died. He on, died like the first combat. Yeah. So Scipio Africanus doesn't come out until like round five of nine, right? Yeah. So over halfway through the game, Scipio finally shows up, and he's this, you know, end all that comes out of Rome that's supposed to finally defeat Hannibal historically. Yep. And instead of facing Hannibal on the front where I'm coming in from the north uh, in Italy. Yep. He decides to sail over to yep. attempt to sack Carthage. Which I will say, the reason I did that was because I thought that I could take over like your other two smaller like generals that you had over there. I could just like demolish them. Also, the other the other general that I did have was just as strong as Scipio, or just about. Um, and he was kind of standing guard at the Alps with a bunch of troops. Mm -hmm. Like his, um, I think his ops points were about the same or something, like. He was harder to maneuver, but you had to go through him, and so. But his and his attack value was good, or whatever that I can't remember what that command value maybe or is it yeah. command power or something. So that was like equal to Scipio. So I thought like, okay, I'll take Scipio over to to uh, Carthage and wreck and try to ransack that to get rid of a lot of your ops points over there. Um, didn't work at all. Or my political control points. Yes, you mean? your political control points. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, that definitely didn't work for you. Nope. Uh, which was funny. Yeah. And I remember sending a picture into like our wargaming chat on Slack, and Lorcan was like, "What? What the? the yeah. <laughs> what the heck, Joel? <laughs> yeah. Like you're horrible at this game. How did you let Scipio yeah. die? Yeah. Uh, which also, I, I, I ended up at this point in the game. That's when I realized that I, I think I'd been sailing wrong. Um, we kind of talked about it at the time. Like, I think I had been sailing with too many troops or something. No, because I had mentioned at the beginning of the game that you could only you sail. You did, with... but I think I still oh, screwed it up. I know what you did. Yeah. Um, you can sell with the full 10 troops if... With a major the... campaign. No, well, the, it has to have the two the naval sh ship yeah. icons. Yeah, and I think I might have sailed with more with only like With one, one ship icon, where yeah. I think you could only at that point sail with five or six. Yeah. So I, I'd screwed that up earlier on in the game and I just had forgotten about it. So that was part of the reason that I lost Scipio is because I could only because the card I had only could sail with five. I don't know that I ever had a two ship one, or if I did, I just had it really early and it wasn't worth it. So or something. But let's talk about rule mishaps, right? Yeah. This game is <sighs> I I think honestly, if you were to ask me what is the most complicated game you've learned, I think it's this one. Over and John Company? I do. I John Company is such a weird one because it seems overwhelming and incredibly complicated. And then when you play it, you're like, this makes so much sense and it's so simple. I don't understand yeah. why it was so hard to learn it. Yeah. Bad rule book. Yeah, um, that's, that's fair. Hannibal is also difficult because of the bad rule book. It's really not that bad of a game. It yeah. really isn't. Um, the problem with Hannibal, even, even if the rule book was great, the problem with Hannibal is that there's so many minor rules for specific edge cases that come up all the time yeah and it's playing through those first few matches of hannibal incorrectly to then figure out how to actually play it because if you sit there without ever playing the game and you're trying to learn from the rule book i think there's a point where you have to say okay i need to just put the game on the table and play through it yeah and make mistakes and then learn from that because there's so much going on in this game. I don't think you can just visualize it and remember from section to section. Yeah. Um, especially when it gets into the movement and the combat, that is a very intricate and honestly it's convoluted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It is because when, convoluted. when you're moving, uh, and you, you move like near an enemy, that enemy then can decide to intercept. And then it's kind of unclear on the rules. If they succeed at the intercept, if they actually get to start combat or if the active player starts combat, it sounds like the active player does, but thematically it seems weird that that yeah. would be the case. Yeah. And then if you fail, uh, at actually intercepting, then, um, they can decide not to do combat anyway. Yeah. Well, and you can only intercept if they're not already going to trigger combat with you. Yeah. Uh, which is another like little minor rule that yeah. you may have been playing incorrectly. Yep. 
Um, and then there's also rules for movement and avoiding combat and pursuing if somebody tried to avoid combat. So yeah. there's a lot of weird movement rules. And then you finally get into combat, which for the most part, combat is actually easier to understand than the movement, which sounds weird because yeah. you always feel like in games, movement's real simple, right? And then the combat is a little bit more involved. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's the other way around. Now the combat yeah. is involved in this game for sure, but I think the movement is a bit trickier to understand because yeah. there's well, a lot of if then. I mean, the thing with combat is that it's really just play a card, play a card. Or I play a card, you play a card. That's really all it is. So technically it's simple, but yeah. what happens from the card, depending on the cards we played, changes everything. The bluffing and uh, understanding like what cards your opponent yeah. could have, trying yeah. to card count a little bit. Yeah, the the which speaking of that the biggest problem with the combat is that just based on pure luck you can completely lose combat like from the first card you could have a hand of 11 cards this happened to me you could have a hand of like 11 cards and your opponent has like six and they play the one card you don't have it could happen and it happened <laughs> and so it's just it that's that's one of the um like annoyances for me was just like how you could be completely outmatched and not that it's not that that isn't thematic. Like th there are times when like generals have been greatly outnumbered and outsmarted their opponent. Right. Which, which thematically that's what that means is that like you um, did a maneuver that I wasn't prepared for, but I didn't get to prepare. Yeah. The, the question really is like, sure. It's thematic, right? That yeah. the, the, Usually the combat, the person who has more battle cards and we'll is just, the aggressor is set up to win. Yeah. But that doesn't guarantee that they're going to win. No. And the stronger the battle rating of the opponent's general, the yeah. better chance that they get to turn the tides of battle, which that makes sense too. Yeah. And you can account for that because that's the general you're putting into battle. Yep. Yep. Uh, but what Joel's saying, yeah, like with the card draw, you could get screwed and I happen to have the one card Joel didn't have and he can't match it and yep. it forces him to lose battle, yeah. which I mean, like I get it. I just wish there was some way that I could plan for different types of maneuver maneuvers, like instead of just getting dealt them, if that makes sense, like it, um, to just kind of alleviate that, like maybe you get to pick some maneuvers in some manner or something like because with the way it works, you're just getting dealt them. And like, right. based on how it's randomly shuffled, if you don't get dealt flank left and they just play flank left, you're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and you're just like, what? This makes no sense. But it's... Um, and I found that that didn't happen, at least me personally. I don't feel like that happens a lot when you start drawing a lot of battle cards. No, but it doesn't happen. But it's definitely happen. like, if, well, you're, if you're drawing five or less battle yeah. cards, like you for sure could get Sure, and, and reserve helps with that because that's a wild. The wild. But, but it's like... I don't know. It, that also shows your hand if you play a reserve early yeah. because it lets them know, hey, he probably doesn't have a flank left. He could. Yeah. You could also just be taking a risk. It's yeah. kind of risky to play uh, reserve if you have yeah. a flank left. Yeah, because it's like, what if they like decide to not continue to play that and right. play something else that you actually don't have? Yeah, yeah. In combat, you're playing uh, from the shared hand of cards. You you are a shared deck of cards, but we have our separate like private hands and you're trying to match formation. So if I play flank left, Joel needs to play flank left. And then after that, he can roll a die to see if it uh, is equal to or lower than his general's battle rating, I believe. Yep. And if it is, then he actually gets to be the aggressor and he gets to choose the card to play. Yep. And it goes back and forth until somebody can't match or somebody forfeits yep. and retreats. And then you dole up casualties both sides can potentially lose some casualties yep. and then the loser can lose even more casualties yep because it, it's based on how long the battle went on based on how many each side loses right and then it's based on whatever card was played and then how many cards were played or, so, or no it's based on what card was played how many get lost right because um, you roll a die at the end based on yep. the card that was played yep. so yeah so and then it depends on what faces are so there, there's kind of a lot of bit of randomness there but there's, but there's also, with that randomness, there is bluffing. There's a lot of thinking and trying to outwit your opponent. Yeah. I never felt like in, in a battle situation, unless you just were dealt a bad hand of cards yeah. from the start, I never felt like there wasn't a chance. Like There was always something to think about and trying to anticipate my opponent's next move. Yeah. I always felt like combat was very tense and focused. Yeah um the what one of the really interesting situations that can arise is like you can get dealt a hand so you have like 
six cards, mm-hmm. and five of them are the same card. You'd think, oh, that's really bad. I have no variation. But if you're the aggressor and you stay the aggressor, you're going to win. You, yeah, you know because they don't you, have those Because they're not going to have that many right. of the same card in their hand as well. I mean, it, there's a possibility. I think there's a couple cards that can do that. That have There's like 15 of them or something or 12 of them. So you could have like five and five. But like the chances in with reserve, that helps too. But like if you have the same just over and over and over, you just keep playing it and just stay on the aggressing. Like that can really change up. Um, that, that that can be a really interesting situation. I think that happened one time um, to one of us where like I think so where it was just like I had like four flank lefts and a flank right. That's all I had, <laughs> and the other person has a whole smattering of all the other cards, but they only have like two maximum of any one type, and so then it's just like you play enough flank lefts or flank rights, and it's just about trying to be the aggressor and yeah. making sure you have a general that has a chance to roll well in combat so they yep. can you know do that and there was there were moments where if i didn't win a die roll to take over so i was the one choosing a card joel was going to beat me in combat and then i roll the die hannibal um since he has a really good battle rating usually i'm fighting with hannibal i uh, and then i I'm able to be the aggressor at that point. Then yeah. I lay down the card that I know you don't have and yeah. I win. And I only won because of that die roll. It came yeah. down to the die roll. And yeah. it is, again, like that is randomness. That's luck. Yeah. But Well, and the fact that you had the card that I didn't. It is done in a tasteful way, um, I th- I think. I to can, be argued. <laughs> I can see how uh, s- some people could get turned off by it. And this is something where certain historical war games, I think leverage that luck factor to simulate history or like the chaos of battle and that anything can happen kind of thing yeah um i get where a lot of this game design is coming from that's fair um so it it is a weird thing i i personally like if if the combat system could have a little less luck in it i think it would probably benefit yeah um i would agree but i do like the bluffing and sense of unknown in combat in this game uh there is some combat in like other games you go into and you're like i'm probably going to win this uh but this one even when you feel like you have a solid chance to win it you're still kind of sweating bullets if it's an important battle because anything could happen yeah um but there is ways to mitigate if the more political control you have uh the more units you bring into battle the all of that uh basically tells you how many battle cards you're going to draw the more battle cards you draw the better off you are yeah being the aggressor means you get to be the one that gets to determine how the cards are dealt until uh your opponent rolls well if that if that even happens yep um and then uh is there i feel like there's another way you can also mitigate oh just obviously bringing in the general that has a good battle rating and keeping the generals that aren't as good in combat um out of combat Mm -hmm. and utilizing them elsewhere but it is random and there was a lot of battles especially early game that i felt like i was clobbering you yeah for sure i mean and, and as you should basically as i should we've already mentioned that right yeah and th- i think that thematically speaks to yeah. the design and that, of the i mean game. and there were a couple that went my way not as much my way as like yours had gone your way mm. early on but then like i said with the attrition like you just i just slowly like pushed back and then even though i lost scipio i think it was like one or two rounds later that i ended up winning like even though i lost my best general that i could ever possibly have now i still had my second best i think technically like yeah arguably my second best because he like he's harder to operate or he has like higher ops points but also like higher like military command value or whatever so like he's kind of as a plus minus on that but he's like I think he's got a good ability too or whatever. So like in combat, he's pretty good, but Rome's reinforcements are a bit more flexible on where you can kind of put them. Uh, Cause you can place them with your generals for yep. the most part yep. uh, with a couple restrictions on how you need to place yep. some in it. Well, they have to in, be in like Italy. in your area. And but not... the problem with Carthage's reinforcements is that some of them can show up basically in a city. Yeah. And if you've, left that city a long time ago then you get combat units that just stack up there yeah and they're not being utilized yeah. which worked well the first time that hannibal died yeah 
didn't work so well the second time that Hannibal died because now you had no because then you yeah. had no units stacked up at that point. Well, and that's a weird thing about this game is when Rome's generals die, they're dead uh, yep. because you elect more through the election cycle and you get different generals in the game. Yep. Uh, when Carthage's generals die, they actually get to come back in during the next reinforcements phase, but they yep. go back to like Africa, yeah, or wherever. Yeah, so you're always just like basically pushing them back. So, yeah, so, you're so they have to keep time. advancing um, yep. and just because really you're just trying to stall out because if you can just stall out, I think Rome just wins wins automatically or it's based on political control which usually rome ends up winning i think uh well yeah right? I, it could be either way i, I don't think yeah. rome is guaranteed to always win political well, control rome starts out in a better position for political control they start off better yeah. i think it's a and, bit easier to leverage yeah. with rome early yeah I, I and i think it I, and i think it's because the, the best way for you to win is to ransack rome I think from my initial plays, yeah. I would say that seems like a good strategy, but yeah. it's also a risk. And I think that's kind of where I lost the game Yeah, when I sailed to Italy and I put basically the majority of my resources into trying to sack Rome yep. and I would get one siege point away from actually sacking Rome and winning the game immediately. And then you would kick me out in combat. Yep. Which gets rid of your siege control. And then I start losing combat units. Yep. And then I don't have the hand of cards to like sufficiently raise troops and get enough troops back in my yep. army quick enough uh, to go back and try to siege Rome again. Yep. And so I think I tried to siege Rome like two or three times back to back and failed. Yeah. And then after that, I was scrambling to try to get enough reinforcements to do much of anything. Yeah. So, And then at that point, I think I had had... I had one of my generals over near where Hannibal like um, reset or where you reset him at. And then I killed Hannibal again. And then at that point you were just like, it's over. Yeah. Cause I was already taking over a whole bunch of your political control markers at that point. I was getting rid of them or, or taking or putting mine over there. And so it was starting to become more and more attrition on the, on the political control markers. I th and I think that's when you just gave up. Right. Yeah. I think we we're like a rounder. I think we were halfway through the second to last round yeah. and you could tell the writing on the wall. There was no point to play yeah. it out. Um, and I gave up, uh, which kind of brings me to the, what's happened every time you played this game. Well, okay. Yeah. If you want to go there, <laughs> well, I, I was going to go there at some point and sure, but it, um, you can go ahead and start with whatever you're going to say first. No, you're good. Uh, so yeah, basically what Joel's referring to is I played this game three, four times four time no let's see jonah scott dylan you and amanda so i played five times yep um and every time i played it somebody has always forfeited at some point in the game they've yeah. resigned uh, yep. because they think the other people are going to win yeah sometimes really early looking back on some of those games probably the case um but i think they were early enough that there was definitely still some fight in there, yeah. Uh, and well, I think, I mean, like and I mine. think that was, I think that was obvious because there were a point in the game where I didn't feel like you were necessarily having a lot of fun because you lost a lot of combat, yeah. And I offered to like end the game there because yeah. you, you know, we assumed that like I was probably going to win, but yeah. we stuck with it, and you saw that tide shift. Yeah, that's where that's what I, I mean had with, like, some bad luck. Yeah. And, and that's where the attrition comes in, I think. Uh, that, that's what I kind of what I meant like at the beginning, where it's just like, if you don't give up slowly, you can just attrition out Carthage, it seems like, from Rome's perspective. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which I think works from Carthage's perspective, too, with if you can just com like keep like battering Rome, like it's hard, it, it can be harder to build up troops mm -hmm. like if you just are there and keep battering rome or battering my generals like because once my generals are gone like particularly for that round they're gone assuming i'm not so, losing a lot of units in combat too because yeah. the second i start losing a lot of units and we go back to reinforcements phase guess which get generals get the units and which generals don't right like mm -hmm. rome all of a sudden has all these reinforcements and carthage has to go back to africa to pick up their dudes yeah yeah, uh, that's fair. So when you're going to assault with Carthage, you need to basically succeed. You can't yeah. lose a bunch of units and then have to reset Galway back. Like that kills a lot of time Yeah, and isn't good for Carthage, which yep. is what I ran into. Um, so I think some of those matches, I think were probably called a little too early. Those were learning games. Um, and especially for like the other person who hadn't played before. Yeah. Um, the game with Amanda, that was honestly just uh called it quits because it just wasn't a game for amanda <laughs> no surprise there uh which 
I I appreciate her actually trying to entertain me. So yeah. that was good. Um, so what was the other thing you were going to say? Yeah. So the name of the show is playing for Tsuji. And yes. Tsuji is a Go term. Uh, Go is a game that I love if you follow Cardboard Reality. And it's going to be a reoccurring theme on this show. And uh, Tsuji is a term that means a skillful play or the most skillful play in a local uh, part of a Go board. So you look, you're looking at a local part of the game board and you're trying to figure out how do I react in the situation you place a stone and that happens to be the smartest move you possibly could have made there. Yep. Given the current information and current state of the board. Sure. Everything, uh, yeah. So I want to relate that back to Hannibal. Do we feel like there was a Tsuji moment in this game where it won you the game? And I have my answer for it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest one was sailing over to, uh, I guess that, that's like Spain area, okay. I think, technically. It's like when I sailed over there with one of my generals and then just started taking over a bunch of political control markers. Yeah, I think that definitely put the pressure on at the end and kind of yeah. forced me into a weird spot. Yeah. And that might have been, because you defeated Hannibal twice. I think that yeah. might have been like the second time you defeated him up there. Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of led to the writing on the wall. My answer was going to be more of, I don't know if there was necessarily a Tsuji moment as much as there was the reverse of that, where I made a bad play. I sailed to Italy and I tried to go up from the Southern border cause it was easier to yeah. sail that way, uh, less risky and, uh, work my way up to Rome and then try to sack Rome. And I kept pushing it and then I lost a lot of combat units and it could have worked out for me. Yep. Uh, but luck wasn't in my favor. And so goes, you know, this style of game is kind of what you're getting. Yep. Um, so I took a risk and it didn't pay off for me. And I think that hurt me greatly. Yep. Um, that could have been the Tsuji moment had I sat yep. Rome, right? But yep. it ended up being the reverse of that. Yep. See what I thought you were going to do when you went down there was going to start taking over my political control markers in that area. And I could have done the slow game, right? And tried that, but I was yep. trying to rush the, yeah. the sure thing if I could have got yep. it. Yeah, that's what I was concerned about because I like it. You get so spread out in the game yeah. that I felt like if you start taking that over, then I gotta send people down there, and then you're gonna bring Hannibal over, and then it's like, so yeah, there could have gone here. It would have been yep. interesting, yeah, doing that to see how it may have played differently. I feel like there's yeah. so many different ways you can approach this game. Yeah, uh, that there's a lot of game here. Just Hannibal, not even counting Hamilcar. Yeah, uh, and all the different generals and the way they come out with Rome can yep. change it up. Yep. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because that's completely random. I mean, that's a deck that shuffled at the very beginning other than the first two. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the way combat plays out is always going to play out differently. Yeah. The nice part about Rome being able to like keep one, the pro console, is so that if you end up with one that's good in a good po or in a good position, you can keep him there. Which is another thematic thing. Rome has a whole election cycle during the reinforcements round every round where uh, Rome can elect to pick one of the generals or consuls uh, in play and elect them as a proconsul. Yep. And the proconsul basically historically was elected so that they could continue like leading and commanding an army because they were crucial or key to whatever yep. was going on at the time and it didn't make sense to kick them out of office so you kind of have them be this pro console until they're done doing what it was they were supposed to do yep it's like an extended stay kind of yeah yeah uh so yeah you have the whole election cycle with the way rome's reinforcements work which i think is cool and then you have a lot of flavor text on like the round tracker saying you know second round this is the round that hannibal like this is the year that hannibal would have crossed the alps yep um, or this is the year that this battle happened, this major battle happened. Yep. And I, I think that's cool. And that does that add theme or just, uh, like flavor text to kind of help immerse you. Um, it's probably the latter where like theme is, I think coming more from the way the mechanics play out a little bit. Yeah. But looking back at it after the play had finished, Carthage had a really strong upper hand at the beginning. I was winning a lot of battles, conquering a lot of area with Hannibal, and it seemed a little bleak for you. And then 
mid game, Scipio comes around. Not that Scipio was much help because you basically sailed nope. him to his death. <laughs> I sacked him. <laughs> but about that same time, like stuff started going sour for me. Yeah. And all of a sudden you started getting the edge and you eventually squeaked out the victory at the end. And that speaks to the way the actual events kind of played out, right? Yeah. It definitely played out differently. Scipio didn't sail and die. Yeah. But the overall arc of the war played very similarly, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. Yep. Um, so before we get into your final thoughts on your first play of Hannibal and how you feel about war gaming, I kind of, and this actually could probably bleed into your thoughts. Sure. I think the biggest takeaway from this that probably turned you off was the luck. You Fair. Got, you got this yeah. four hour game mm -hmm. and it feels like anything you do in it is a little risky and it could go bad for you. Yeah. Um, how did you, how do you feel about that? I mean, if I want to play a four hour, four hour game, I'd prefer an 18 XX. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's kind of Joel's response about anything. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, no, but it, like, it, you know, it just long games that have a lot of randomness that can just like immediately end like, I don't know. It, it just felt like it's going to be a long experience that has lots of like Spartacus that you love. <laughs> it's a nostalgic thing. And there's not, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't feel, it, it's just a different type of experience. Like, I don't know. I feel it's like more beer and pretzels yeah, and not as cutthroat. Yeah. Like head to head. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it, there's just le like almost like less pressure from that. Um, so yeah, just sum up like your thoughts on Hannibal and then after you sum up your thoughts on Hannibal, I want you to also answer the question of, are you interested in playing more historical war games? Uh, is there something about historical war games that is appealing to you versus not appealing to you? Um, so my kind of thoughts on it are that I'm not a really big fan of the randomness. Um, I do think that there's plenty of, there are, I can see why somebody would enjoy it like there are redeeming qualities to it that i just don't know are for me necessarily um i definitely see why you like it uh because it, it's definitely that um as a two-player experience kind of ha having that head-to-head -head, it almost feels abstractish in a nature like there is enough theme to it that it's not an abstract but i feel like some of the um, other than the randomness, obviously there's definitely some of those, like having like strategies and tactics to outsmart your opponent at these couple turns, um, that are, that feel indicative of the abstract games that you like. Um, and it's kind of like, you're always trying to just outwit your opponent. Mm -hmm. Um, the randomness definitely keeps it a little bit more balanced where it's not just always the better player is going to win. Cause obviously you had played it four or five times at that point and i'd never played it sure or any historical war game for that matter um so i think that the randomness def definitely like kind of keeps that how i feel about that uh, i don't know i mean i think de definitely if you had played like 20 games of it i don't think i had a chance um yeah i, I think but, if if there is a skill gap for sure that... yeah but it's not like go where it's like you've played like you're like one rank now you're more than one rank higher than me, but I know you said at one point, like somebody that's one rank higher than the other person should never be beat. No, by... no, 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 that's not true. Um, somebody that is, I would say like five ranks above somebody is almost oh. always going to win. Gotcha. Well, in the lower ranks, once you get up to Dawn, right? It's like one Dawn. I could, I d is it different? Uh, maybe it's not. I, I maybe yeah. to like a lesser extent, like if you have a, uh, like a nine proton versus a like a six don. Yeah, that nine proton is probably always going to beat that six don. Gotcha. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, I guess that's that's kind of most of it. The I mean, the randomness kind of bugged me. Okay, a lot. so so let's so, put let's put the randomness aside. Yeah. 
how did you feel about like i know one thing that's kept you from historical war games is the theme like you aren't interested in like war or his like historical war themes and settings yeah did you like it here um no i i I mean like i and this Some is of, one that I feel like you may have liked because well, you it, like the Latin themes and you like... Yeah, so, so like um, Latin and some of the like ancient Greek and Roman history, like I just know some of it and I've been like interested in it and in the past, but like I guess I was more interested in more of the like almost like sociopolitical stuff, like more of like the society of the of the ancient times rather than the... And some of their like religions and how that kind of like played into how their society kind of changed. Yeah. Um, but I was never really that interested in the wars. Like we always learned about them because they were often part of the, like that whole like political and social landscape. Um, but I was never really that interested in the wars. Um, and like the finer details of war, even in like other history classes, like when we had to do like world war two history or something, I, I was never interested in it. Like, I mean, I had to learn it for school, so I'd learn it, but like, I was never really that interested. Those, those aren't pieces of information that I really cared to retain that much. Um, but so I, I, you know, I was never, I've never really been that interested in war. Um, I've more been interested in like economics and social political type things, um, in history, just a personal thing. So, um, not necessarily saying I'm a pacifist for like per se, but like, I just not that interested in learn in that that part of history. Well, I'll be the first to say that I'm a pacifist and I don't love war or anything like that. Yeah. Um, reenacting a historical event like this and learning more about the history and the conflict and how it played out, I, that all fascinates me. Uh, I'd like to be transported back into like a historical event like this, um, but the idea of like actual war, I, you know, I'm not supportive yeah. of that or love yeah. that or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but I know like after you finished playing this, it wasn't a, uh, an immediate, I don't want to play this again. You sat on it for a while because you didn't know how you felt about it. So yeah. there's, there, I think there is some redeeming quality here for you. I mean, I think there's definitely some like strategies to be employed here that like can be interesting. Um, I just don't know the time is what gets me the most. Um, Which there are shorter card driven games. This is sure, definitely on the longer like I, end. Yeah. I mean, I've played 13 minutes and that's completely like, sure. Um, now I get that that's kind of a different style of war game, but um, I still wasn't even that necessarily enthused about that either. Um well, that like, one's like it was an experience, but like that one, I haven't played that, but that one's also like really quick and probably abstracted a bit. Yeah, I mean it is, and that's also not what you like from your games. You want you want a full experience. Yeah, and time doesn't usually bug you. I mean, you're always wanting to play really long 18xx games, but yeah, if but you're that, gonna spend the time playing a game like that, you want it to be a game you love. I get that. Yeah, I, I just I felt more, I, I feel more engaged throughout the time with 18xx games as comparison with um war games I, I i don't know i just didn't feel like i feel like there was only like so much strategy i could employ before i mean I, like i'm not trying to bring the randomness back to the table but there was only like only so much strategy that you could actually like work out um before like that randomness kicked in and then it like didn't matter how much strategy you put into like this particular idea that the randomness was still just going to get you fair. Um, um, I mean, it, it, so like, I, I feel like there is some like math and strategy that can go into that. Um, but just not the type that I like. Yeah. Uh, this is definitely not necessarily a game for you because we've even talked in the past. You don't like the head to head direct conflict games. You want to be able yeah. to, do your own little thing and not be bothered and then just try to outplay more in a multiplayer solitaire or like you also enjoy player interaction. It doesn't have to be multiplayer yeah, solitaire. I mean, I like but, squatters and pretty much all of those are player interaction. But you don't want the kind. direct interaction. You don't want somebody coming straight into your face, no. fighting you and taking your crap. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, we've talked about that even with like back in the day when I was playing like Age of Empires and right. things like that. Like 
I just kind of wanted to build up my engine and then at some point just go smash face. Right. So you're, you're always going to have that issue, I think, with these games. Yeah. Uh, and why they don't fully click with you. Uh, I do think like a lot of historical war games are going to have this randomness and that helps bring in some of the chaos of what can happen in a battle and that it just because you're set up to win doesn't mean you're always going to win. And, you know, historically I feel like that is evident and you have to be okay with that. Um, def- there's historical war games that will do it to a, a varying degree. Like Seki Gahara is much less random there is still the card draw but you have the card of you have the hand of cards in your hand you know what to expect before you even start combat and you can plan better right there's no die roll um where you have something like hannibal and it's kind of the reverse you got the die roll you don't know what kind of battle cards you're going to have in your hand before you start the battle yeah and how you're set up to potentially win you have a much cleaner idea in seki gahara Um, so there's definitely the war games that limit the luck. If that's something that you would be interested in pursuing in the future is just trying a game that has less luck. Yeah, we can do that. Um, but I still think regardless of how much luck there is in a historical war game, you're always going to have a bit of it. And I think that's kind of crucial in making that historical war game kind of like team with, uh, with tension and yeah. with a bit of the unknown yeah, and knowing that it's not always going to work out the way you had planned. And yeah. I think that, Which, I mean, I, and I think that that not to cut you off, but I, I think that's definitely indicative of war. Like it, I, I think that that part of, of those games are thematic. I just don't know that that's necessarily means it's for me. So I think at the end of the day, you can kind of look at historical war games and I think what they're focused on is developing a narrative. And that needs to be something that you want out of a game. Sometimes people don't want that narrative. They just want to play a game and see who comes out on top. Uh, You can get the who comes out on top with these war games, but it's, I think more than that is looking back at the course of the events that led up to the end of the game and how even though you may set yourself up for success sometimes it didn't go in your way, your favor and yeah. you always have those tense moments where you draw that card and it and it's either good or bad or you roll the die and it's good or bad and it could go either way on yeah. a, on something as simple as a die roll it could yeah. be a really big conflict resolved on a die roll or a really big conflict resolved on some other luck factor yeah it happens. And I think that really does build to the unpredictable narrative and speaks to the way war kind of always plays out. And that's fair. And that like especially like reading into Combat Commander, there's a lot of those elements in that game. And it I think it, the people that tend to really like Combat Commander are the people that are talking about how wonderful the narrative is by the time you're done with a scenario yeah. and how every scenario always plays out completely differently anytime you play it and it's just fascinating so yeah it i don't think a narrative is necessarily something you're looking for in a game yeah but like scott and i and it's weird to think that i'm looking for a narrative in a game because typically i'm not like if you look at the other types of games i like yeah heavy euros 18xx go like there's not a well narrative. i just don't think they tell a story in the same way that you're looking for like you because you like books you like i mean you you like some a lot of sure. different kinds of books to tell a good story and so like you are looking for a narrative i just think that a lot of the games other games we were talking about like they just don't they, they don't tell the type of narrative you're looking for and i think maybe historical war games do i don't think gaia project tells a narrative no, it doesn't. And I don't think it's trying to, and that's fine. Right. And I, I so, think 18xx, you could maybe argue there's a bit of a narrative there, but not really. Not like you would see in a war game. Or Summit, not a war game. That game yeah. definitely has a narrative, though. Yeah. And the only reason that game has stuck with me, because I didn't enjoy my play of it. Yeah, is because of the Because narrative. of the narrative. Yeah. So, like, there is something there with, I feel like if a good war game needs to tell a narrative. It needs to tell a story um, as yeah. you play. Um, and I, and I think this one nails that. And so like my impressions after five plays, uh, this game was one I had rated number two on my list of favorite games of, uh, that I've played yep. ever, which now got back in maybe pushed down because of go, it definitely got pushed down. Cause go is my number one, even though it's not there yet. Yeah. 
Uh, now, whether or not it's below number two now is another maybe another story, but yeah. So it's weird. Um, I need to play Hannibal more because it has a lot of great things going for it, in my opinion. I think it's very immersive. I think it's a very tense experience. Um, I am fully invested in the time period. I think it's thematic. Uh, but then on the other side of the coin, um, I enjoy. I love the combat. I think the combat's great. But at the same time, the combat can be a little too luck driven, um, and it can sour people. Uh, the playtime is definitely too long, uh, and the rule fiddliness and trying to remember all the little bitty rules and learn the game is a mountain to climb. So, like, those are some big negatives. So, you kind of have to take that into account, too. So, if this is a, if you're interested in this game, it needs to be a game that you have somebody that is willing to sit down and play multiple sessions with you. That you're not just going to learn it, play it once, put it on the shelf, because then you're going to have to go through that nightmare of relearning it again. Yeah. Uh, but if you can learn it the first time, it's totally worth it if you're going to play it a lot with one person learn those fiddly rules i think there's a lot of game here and I, like a lot of people say this is a masterpiece card driven uh cdg game just like twilight struggle is uh, i hear this one mentioned all the time as one of the best cdgs of all time and i see it but there's definitely some you can see the old age on it with yeah. the amount of rules that are in this thing for sure um but it's one that I definitely want to play some more, uh, whether that will be with Joel or probably somebody else. Uh, maybe. <laughs> probably somebody else, yeah. but, but maybe Joel. <laughs> we'll see. If he's feeling adventurous. Yeah. Um, but expect to hear more about Hannibal from me, especially I'd like to get Hamilcar played so I can have uh, an opinion on both of the systems. Yeah. Um, but with that said, are you looking to play any other historical war games or no? not particularly i mean I, I would try others just to see but i don't know that i'm like really itching to play anything particularly um yeah it's basically yeah. like if there's one i'm like hey joel you need to play this let's play it yeah. it'd be forcing you to play it yeah and not really like, like something I, that you would want to do I, i'm not <laughs> so stuck in my ways to say that I can't be convinced, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to like it. Like I, it's not going to, it may not mean that I'll want to play it after like one play. Right. Yeah. So fair enough. Yep. Well, that is Hannibal and Hamilcar. Uh, you will definitely hear more about that sometime in the future and you'll see how it falls on my list next year. If you don't hear about it until then, yep. um, might be playing it with Herb at the cabin. He mentioned uh, cool. potentially playing it, but I know we have a lot of games to get to the table, and that yep. is a long one. Yep. So we'll see. Uh, but after that, uh, the only other thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, I wanted to share some music with all of you. Um, music is something that I've been just totally into since I ever could remember. Uh, my favorite band for the longest time as a kid was Kiss. Yep. And we were actually talking about that in Slack. Sanchez oh, yeah. said that I think the band he's seen the most live was Kiss. And I've seen Kiss like twice live um, when I was younger. They're now like a guilty pleasure band. Like, yeah, they're not like, I'm not going to say like Kiss is my favorite band or anything like that. They're a guilty pleasure, but they're very nostalgic to me. Uh, but uh, ever since then, like I've always been into music and um, my background was always like classical or not classic, but classic rock music. Um, I went from Kiss to loving bands like Led Zeppelin, Rush, Pink Floyd. Yep. And then as I got into college, I started discovering more modern uh, rock music. And the band that has resonated with me the most is, I think, fitting to talk about on uh, the premiere episode of the show. Um, my favorite band of all time is My Morning Jacket yep. and has consistently <laughs> been My Morning Jacket uh, yep. for years now. I've seen them... Oh, I think like 12 times live. That's a lot. And you've seen a, um, the guitarist solo. Uh, and you've seen so a couple of them solo, I guess, right? Yeah, I've seen the uh, Jim James. He's the front man. I've seen him solo twice. And I've seen the uh, the drummer had a side band that I saw live once. And then I've seen the uh, lead guitarist, who's actually from Indianapolis. Oh, um, that's right. I've seen him solo once as well, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, I absolutely love my morning jacket. And if I were to recommend an album to listen to from these guys, 
the one I would say is Okanokis. Uh, it's readily available if you go to Spotify or I'm sure it's on Apple Music or wherever you get your music. It's on YouTube. Uh, look up Okanokis. That's O-K, O-K-O-N-O-S. I think I spelled that right. Okanokis. I think you missed it. Or I, don't I, know, yeah. I have <laughs> it's it. Fine. It's fine. Right. It's O K O N O K O S. There you go. And it's okay. this is a double feature like live album. So there is a ton of music on this. This is not just a studio recording. Um, so I think this was recorded over some shows they did in San Francisco back in 06 or 07. And it covers their first four albums. Um, they play some songs off of all of those albums. And it's just great uh my morning jacket is a weird band i can't really explain them they sort of started off as alternative country they called it alt country although it doesn't sound country it just has you know some pedal steel here here or there yeah or a bit more of a, a southern like twinge on it or like folk sound but some twang not a, not even a lot of twang. There's not yeah. a lot of twang. But then as you start, yeah, you wouldn't be listening to it if there's any twang. <laughs> as you gravitated towards their like third album, it starts getting more of like this heavy rock kind of more sounding closer to Led Zeppelin, but still like far from that too. Um, and then come their fourth album, which is Z, totally different sound than anything I've ever heard before. Wordless chorus. Uh, it's the opening song on Okanokis and the opener on Z uh is exactly what it it says it is the chorus is a wordless chorus uh he basically just sings this loud noise like or like he's singing but there's no words and that's the chorus um but it has this really funky uh like keyboard in it and like bass note at the beginning um that is very distinctive and that's how the album starts off it's a fun song um and then not too far into the album, you get to One Big Holiday. So if you are a big guitar guy and you like a lot of loud guitar music, One Big Holiday is the one that I would recommend listening to. Um, and then two of my favorite songs of all time, period, are on this. And uh, the first one being I Will Sing You Songs. This is honestly one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. Um, Carl Brommel, which is the Indianapolis guy, that's the lead yep. guitarist now. Uh, before he joined the band, because uh, he joined it when they put out Z. So uh, I Will Sing You Songs was on the third album. And he listened to that. I think the first time he heard it was on the radio. And by the end of that song, he was like, who are these guys? I need to meet them and I need to play this song. Like he was just floored about like how amazing that song was. Yeah. That's and cool. and the song is great. Absolutely great. It's a song that I can always listen to and I don't tire of. Um and the other song that's my favorite of all time is Steam Engine. Uh, this is another long song on the uh, live album. Um, and it was one of the last songs on their third record. Uh, also a beautiful song. It kind of builds. It has a progression to it. Um, and on the live album, there's actually a drum solo at the end of it, which is kind of cool. Uh, just absolutely love this band. Totally unique. Um, if you've ever watched American Dad, there's actually an episode completely dedicated to My Morning Jacket. Oh, really? If you remember that episode, huh. this is a legitimate band that those songs you heard on that episode were My Morning Jacket. Huh. Stan basically becomes obsessed with My Morning Jacket. Interesting. And can't stop listening to them. And uh, Doesn't seem like the type of show that would have that. It's because the, one of the writers, I think, went to Bonnaroo and saw My Morning Jacket oh. and became obsessed with them and then had to do a whole episode dedicated to them. That's neat. Um, so it's a cool, cool episode. I recommend listening to Okanokis. And then if you like it, check out that episode of American dad. Uh, it's pretty funny, especially once you get to know the band a bit more. Yeah. But that's it for me. Do you got anything you want to add, Joel? Nope. No. All right. I'm interested to see how this uh, new format's going to go. Yeah, me too. I don't know. Doing video is weird, but. Uh -huh. we'll <laughs> yeah. All right. Remember to keep cardboard gaming a reality in your life. Bye, everybody. See you later. Thank you.